So, what more is there to say about trolls? Um, once in a pub quiz Greg made up, one of the questions was, how many times has Chiasium published the Kiger Leader Cult? And I believe the answer was 13. 13. Yeah. It was one of the first three cults ever done because it was in the original first edition RuneQuest. And then it was in Cults of Prax, then it was in Troll Cults, and then it was in Different Worlds magazine, and it just, you know, then it was in Gods of Glorantha, and uh, I don't know where all the 13 came from, but it was published a lot. So the trolls got their origin from Greg's read of uh, a <clears throat> um, combination of Scandinavian, uh, most of Scandinavian lore with the, with the troll door, which were both dwarfish and large creatures. So unlike Dungeons of the Dragons, for example, trolls had to have a range of size. He based their nature off the, um, he called them the Eaton, which was some kind of old uh, Celtic thing. That, there were giants, always hungry, eating everything. So that was the basis there. And then when he came up with the idea of Glorantha um, starting, well, first there's the War of the Dragons and the Giants or whatever, which is lost in in prehistory and maybe didn't even happen. Then we go to darkness comes first out of the out of the chaosium. And the trolls they're not trolls yet, there's just the concept of them. And of course what happens in all the um uh the um the theogony of Glorantha is you start with with raw primal forces that then give birth to more refined weaker forces and, and cascading down. So, so the mistress trolls are a cascade down from the primal spirits, you know, and these things are in the uh, living in, in hell. And then the other parts of Glorantha that are like kind of form on top of it, stacked up there. But the trolls just stay in hell not doing anything as far as, I mean, or if they're doing something, what they did is lost to, uh, to prehistory. Their first contact with the outside world comes when uh, no one, on, no one in, on the surface world knows about the trolls or anything in the darkness. And uh, Orlant murders the sun. It goes to hell, and this is the first light they've seen. And, uh, and everything in hell leaves to come to the surface. So this is actually when insects first appear on the surface world, because that's one of the things that came. And the trolls also come, but they're scarred by the light. And so they regard this as the first curse, where now, instead of just being the mistress race, now the mistress race is mostly giving birth to dark trolls, which breed true. And, uh, you know, the, the Uzco. So they are regarded as a damaged, inferior version of the original trolls. Um, the troll afterlife is often a promise that when they go to hell, they'll be a uh, mistress again, or they'll even like descend back into mindless um, darkness spirits. But who knows, right? The troll hell is, uh, is also the troll heaven. So <clears throat> the trolls come to the surface. They uh, uh, spread across it with, uh, with uh, great power with the insects eating all the plants. The earth gods all die and go to sleep. Um, uh, the storm gods are rampaged around. The darkness is rampaged around. Sea, make, sea kind of, earth kind of takes it under the chin. Even sea invades the earth for a while. And um, at the, uh, everything, basically earth and sky are, are screwed over. And uh, storm and darkness and sea are rampaging. And then, um, one of the gods, uh, uh, Ragnagar, who is sometimes claimed to be a storm god, but it also might be a, uh, a propaganda ploy by his enemies. He might not have been a storm. Um, uh, uh, it forms the unholy tr tr uh, uh, conspiracy, and they bring in chaos uh, again. So Glorantha had come out of chaos, and now chaos is coming out of Glorantha, and um, the uh, and then yeah, the whole world falls apart, and everyone has to fight. You know the chaos. Even the trolls are fighting chaos. Um, 
Although, in the early days of Chaosium, when Steve Perrin was running the campaign and Ken Coffer and those guys, they, they didn't confuse Darkness and Chaos, but they often associated them together. Although in later versions of the mythology, it became clear that trolls were enemies of Chaos. Which doesn't mean that Darkness is always an enemy of Chaos, obviously. But uh, I guess there were still tendencies to go back to the old good-bad dichotomy that um, D&D had, for instance. So <clears throat> we've got the... Uh, We've got the, the, the trolls fighting the everything. There's chaos mutations forming the, the, um, the cave trolls. And the trolls are, on the surface world, they're essentially evolving into lots of different paths. Okay? And um, one of the things that happens is that there is an um, invasion of Pamotella by combined darkness and storm. In the uh, which was most successful in the uh, east, north, uh, northwestern part, and in this part, um, uh, Pamal spears the darkness cold god that's coming in and kills the cold. And so, his dark trolls become what are later known as jungle trolls, and they view themselves as cursed too because they're they're big like dark trolls, but they don't they don't have any of the cold ability, and it's not always clear exactly what limitations this gives them. But they don't live in large groups; they live in little bands in the jungle, and they don't have the they never have the the force or are able to build like kingdoms and stuff like the trolls, like the like the Uzco can. Um, so maybe that's a a side effect of that. Um, they don't. They don't seem to have mistress races among them, and that might be because the mistress race can't really survive in the heat of the jungle. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, the trolls are on the surface, and then everyone decides after the compromise that we're all going to make friends and, and be happy and, and like each other. But they sort of don't. Instead, there's huge wars between the uh, the various elder races. The trolls are fighting the elves. The elves are fighting the dwarves. The dwarves are fighting the you know. Uh, everyone, and, um, and in these wars, the elves are also in a civil war, so they kind of get hurt bad. Uh, the dwarfs get beat by everyone, because they aren't so great on the surface world. Um, and this is when a lot of the old, I mean, most of the Mostali are killed when Chaos comes in, because they all live in the spike. But a lot of them are killed um, in these wars, too. So there's only like a handful of them left. Um, I mean, there's the there's the Quicksilver Mostali that lives in Dragon Pass. There's, um, I think there's some lead ones in Pamotella, and then there's a, uh, a couple in Nidan, and I can't even remember what they are, but there's not many. I mean, there's probably less than 10 Mostali in all of Garampa. So if you met a Mostali in your campaign and killed it, that was like 10% of all the Mostali. <clears throat> And they don't reproduce, mostly don't reproduce. So um, that was, they never had to because no one ever died in the god time. So just you had whatever mostly you had and they just did their job. Um, that was the cool thing about the clay ones because they could actually make new mostly, you know. Anyway, back to the trolls. Um, anyway, in the, worms, in the Empire of the Worms Friends, so the elder races are killing other others so much that the humans actually are able to rise to the forefront and start to dominate the world after the first few hundred years, first few centuries, which is, you know, something no one expected would ever happen because everyone just had contempt for the humans. Well, the elder races did. I guess they still do, but now it's unjustified contempt. It's more like penis envy now of the humans, you know, because they're cool and the elder races suck. So the... Um, so the Empire of the Worst Friends gets humans working with dragon newts to the forefront. And they, um, and dragon is another good example of how nothing bred in the god time. Because the dragon newts are just larval dragons. And they don't, I mean, they don't give birth to new, to new dragon newts, you know. Um, if you meet a, uh, a crested dragon newt, it's probably alive at the god time. Which shows how much, how, how much they, they, they suck in personality. Because they've lived for hundreds of years, thousands of years, and have never progressed past crested. Because they're too cowardly or lazy or, or stupid, you know. So, um, 
and, and, and so when it says in the uh, in the rules that crested dragon newts are, are are cowardly and 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 uh, you know cautious, they are because these they've been doing that for two thousand years. You know, um, and of course they can slowly progress. But I guess the logic is if you're a dragon newt is that since you have forever to do it because you never die, then you may as well like why why bother? It's like it'll happen. To sit around. Now, of course, they are wrong because periodically there's a threat that all Glorantha will be destroyed and then they will be destroyed too. But uh, I guess they don't think about that. Or if they do, those are the ones that do think about that are the ones that work forward. Um, so, the, so the trolls work with the Empire of the Worst Friends and they make you know, the god egg. And then the trolls, for some reason, and it's not completely clear, decide this is blasphemous or something's wrong with it. And it's not like the trolls are like super dedicated to a religion that has blasphemy as a thing, right? I mean, how do you blaspheme kind of your leader? So the humans interpret it as blasphemy, but it might be something else going on. And it might be that they're smelling chaos in the egg. Who knows? But the, but the, the trolls leave the, leave the project. And the... Uh, the, the, the new god, Gabaji, um, curses them. That's the claim. And also curses the dragon newts. Um, the dragon newts ignore the curse, or it's usually said the dragon newts are able to shed off the curse. But it's possible the curse worked, but we just don't know what the curse was and what effect it had on them. Because. No, it was the worst friends that made the egg. No, that was the second council. Yeah, I know, which was, which was, a, oh, you're right. Emperor of Friends is the next century, is the next age. Yeah, it's the second council. The, the, the fir, well, the first council is making it, and then the second council finishes it. Yeah. The broken council, as they say. So, um, but you can tell things were going bad because they were, because originally they had, um, uh, Zola Umbar is the troll representative on the council, and then they swapped him out for um, our, for uh, Zorix Zoran. So things are going. If you need Zorix Zoran on your council of advisors, then something's going wrong. Um, so the trolls get cursed, and the effect of the curse is that now about half the time they give birth to Trollkin, which at first they, they I mean they don't know what to do, and then they kill them, and then they don't kill them. And then they try to break the curse, as is well known. And of course, the two famous attempts to break the curse are the one that makes the great trolls, which prove useful, um, and the one that makes the uh, them we have litters of trollkin. And uh, in the original text, it says that the uh, what we wrote it, it says that you give birth to one d six trollkin, but. Um, also, the rules say that the way the trolls define you as a trollkin or not is if you are a single birth, which means that there's a couple of cases where they give birth to twin dark trolls and they're considered trollkin, but they, obviously they can tell that they're not regular trollkin. They don't eat them, you know. Um, but it also would mean that one out of the six times a trollkin birth would be um, would be considered a dark troll because it was a single one. So maybe we should have said it was 2d3, you know. Uh, so there's always at least twin, dark, <clears throat> twin trollkin. Um, <clears throat> so, but, but now you have the trollkin. And um, there's, there, the trolls are diffident about the... They're ambivalent about the trollkin because on the one hand, um, trolls now are breeding badly enough that having the trollkin has helped them survive as a species. And on the other hand, they're Trollkin instead of like actual trolls. Because um, no troll loves its Trollkin, right? It's like, it doesn't, doesn't really count as a kid. Now, we also know that they can sometimes breed quite a few of these Trollkin. That might be partly because the Trollkin can also interbreed among themselves. Because dark trolls don't like want to mate with Trollkin usually. I mean, they can. Um, and so there's been a couple times in history when out of... Uh, uh, the troll lands north of Dragon Pass, huge swarms of Trollkin came in and like ate the crops. And there was wars against the Trollkin. And, and, it's, and this might be a troll plot. What they're doing is they're gathering up the Trollkin in big pens and holding on to them until they have 
like 50,000 Trollkin, and then to say, okay, we don't have to feed them anymore, send them off and harass the humans and see what happens. You know, just to keep, kind of keep the humans suppressed is the plan, right? Um, and, uh, and so that, that one of the things that happened. Let's see, I think I, in one of my other earlier things, I talked about the, uh, uh, the Hall of Golden Light, right? Is any of you guys there for that? So trolls, basically the trolls up in, uh, <clears throat> in, in the troll lands, in, in Dragon Pass, um, they essentially act as raiders and robbers to the people of Dragon Pass. They come down there and they, they bushwhack you and steal your stuff and carry it back and, you know, behave like monsters instead of like, a, you know, another nation. I mean, obviously you can go up there and, and deal with them. And the trolls in Degori and Karth don't act like monsters necessarily. I mean, they might eat you, obviously, but they aren't, they aren't all sitting around under bridges waiting for someone to come, right? Um, but the troll, if you re meet a troll party in uh, Dragon Pass, they're probably there to, to, to kill you and, and take your stuff. Um, it's kind of like in, in America where I live, we have alligators. And... Um, in my part of Texas. So if an alligator is on the shore, it's like, it's just on the shore. I mean, if you walk up and kick it, it will try to bite you or hit you with its tail, but it's not, it's not hungry. You can throw food to it and it will ignore it. But if an alligator is in the water, then, it, then it's hungry, it's hunting. So, you know, you see the trolls in Dragon Pass are alligators in the water, so to speak. You know, they're hunting. Now, of course, the trolls in Degorian Karth are hungry too, because trolls are always hungry. But, they have, but they're also doing other things. They're getting married and they're having cultural events and they're you know, forging tools and they're going, up, going to the uh, uh, Zorak Zoran Smith to get bronze weapons because they're the only guys that can smith them um, because they have fire. You know? um, but the Hall of Golden Light comes to the fact that one of the things the trolls steal from humans is wheels, golden wheels. And the trolls don't like those because you know they're they're gold, so they're they smell bad, they taste bad. Um, they kind of if you hold them in your skin for a long time, they give you a little rash. They're just you know if you're a troll. So so they store them all in this huge cavern in the Castle of Lead, where they and they've been storing them since the dawn. So they have a lot of wheels, and one of their plans for the Hero Wars is they're going to take all this wealth of maybe hundreds of thousands of wheels and they're going to, they're going to put it in wagons or, or some other way and they're going to basically send it down into the human lands. And the purpose is to completely destroy the human economy because they know that will disrupt a lot of things. There'll be wars and disruptions over it. And then in that d disorder, the trolls wouldn't call it chaos. In that disorder, the trolls can then take advantage. They don't need the wheels, and it will destroy the humans. So that's that's one of their plans for the uh, for the hero wars to destroy the human economy with the gold. So you know, a, a, an awesome adventure would be for the trolls to contact your your adventurers and say, "Hey, the trolls are it's time for their plan." So they will use your adventurers to get a cartload of you know. 100,000 wheels and take it down into the human lands. Free of charge. Yeah, free of charge, just take it, go, you know? And, uh, and they might want to put some, they might put some facade on it, like they're pretending to charge them for it in some way, you know? Like give them a job to do it. Uh, this, and this Trollkin will go along with you, don't make you spend it where we want you to spend it, but then of course they expect you to kill the Trollkin and take the money, right? You know, kind of, it's like a fake, anyway. So that would, that's, you know, there it is. There's a cool adventure for the humans. And then of course it leads to catastrophe. When you, when you, of course, when you get there with your wagon load, you find out there's like eight other adventurer groups that also have 100,000 wheels. <laughs> <laughs> and like everyone's going crazy. And somebody's like, well, we better, we better get out of, of Dragon Pass with this money because like every, there's too much money here. So you're heading up into the Lunar Empire or down into the Holy Country and over to Prax and then like it just spreads, right? Yeah. You know, the giants? The other giants. I mean, uh, there has been a shortage of gold wheel dancers, but one was found in the stack of wheels. How many gold wheel dancers are there? The trolls didn't even think of that. Mm. 
That was completely off the radar. My and if there are gold rule dancers, then um, well, actually, the mistress race trolls probably have gone through it and picked out all the gold rule dancers because they remember them, yeah. and and they're not opposed to them. No. They were their allies, you know. So I don't know. They might they might take them out and leave them there, or or one of the the caravans might be all gold wheel dancers, unbeknownst to them. Although really, most of the gold wheel dancers that are wheels are I mean that's their that's their skeleton, right? So they aren't really alive. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so so who knows? You can add that in too if you need gold wheel dancers. But uh, so little is known about them. I mean, one has appeared in the whole third age. So like we never made stats for them or anything. We just know that when they die, they become a wheel. Or, or sometimes when they just get bored or tired or they get sick of everything, they just become a wheel and then they're a wheel. And um, so the original wheels were these and then all the rest were made in imitation. But it's not like there was thousands of gold wheel dancers. You know, they were always a rare thing. So that was, that's the troll plot. Um, Can I ask you a question about the wheels? Sure. So the story about local nose thinking about the wheels and creating very this bullshit. It's actually gold wheel dancers that took this shape. Well, the the round shape is based on the fact that the sun is round, right? And that the, the blue moon is round and that general and there's there was also the wagon wheel in the sky already. Mm -hmm. so, well that may have appeared after the wheel dancers. So Locarnus's wheel is based off the um, the uh, off the sun, mm -hmm. right? And the gold wheel dancers I mean, they probably weren't made by Locarnos, but they probably weren't called, before Locarnos, they probably weren't called wheel dancers, okay. right? Mm -hmm. They were probably called something else, but then they said, oh, look, they spin around, they, they roll around in a circle, and so they are, uh, they are wheel dancers. So that, so that may have come later, you know? Kind of the way that I point out in one of my talks that um, this, we know the Serpent Men got their start in the before the age of dinosaurs in in Call of Cthulhu or in the Cthulhu Wars, but there weren't serpents then. That's before there were snakes. Snakes didn't appear till like the Cretaceous. So how can they be serpent men without serpents? So they had to have some other name back then. The gold wheel dancers, you had them before there was wheels. So, and maybe the Gilcarnas got the idea from the fact that they roll, you know. So. Um, and then, I mean, Ronance has wheels. Well, Ronance has wheels in his chariot, and the sun god is supposed to have a chariot. Yes. So, you know, maybe wheels are just a thing. Maybe round things started with the, with this, when the sky came up. You know? Uh, I mean, the darkness rune is round too, but it might just be because before the darkness rune appeared, it was just a blot of darkness. There wasn't even a circle. It was just like, like, runes didn't matter, you know? I mean, so... Okay, so let's see. In the southern hemisphere, um, you have the jungle trolls living in the jungle, feeling cursed. And for, and for a while, there were, um, in one part of Glorantha, I think it was the south, there was horned trolls. And it's not clear where the horns came from. Maybe they interbred with, uh, with storm spirits. Um, in, in, uh, in our campaign that we had in Pamotella at Chaosium for years, one of the things that happened is that one of the characters who was a dark troll um, <clears throat> was captured by the jungle trolls with the other rest of the party. And the jungle trolls said, whoa, a dark troll. So they made him, so they basically, they knew about the ceremony that made great trolls. And so they, tr they mated the dark troll, the player character dark troll. They did that ceremony with him in a darkness spirit. To produce, to produce a jungle troll that would a new troll that would not be cursed with the lack of cold, but what they got was a horned troll, because this dark troll had previously been cursed. Um, orange. What? Well, he orange. was orange, but he also had be, had be, um, had like been married to a bison when he was in uh, in uh, the wastes. So the kid was a was a horned troll. So, but the, but the horn trolls have cold. So they sent him up to the, to the uh, Mari Mountains to live and, uh, and fostered him. And then the, uh, so now there's a tiny population of, of horned trolls in the Mari Mountains. So they've come back from extinction. Um, okay. And uh, then of course, other types of trolls. There's the, uh, the ice trolls, which might really just be dark trolls. Okay, it's not, they're very similar. 
they're, I mean, they're a little fatter and, and, and a little bigger, but they're not, but it might be like the difference between, you know, Eskimos and Watusi instead of actual new species. They don't seem to have trolken, but it might be because they eat them all because they don't need trolken in the north. Um, Well, they, well, you know, someone's gnawing the ice sheet, but, uh, but we don't know if, ice, if snow trolls are actually a different species, whereas the jungle trolls are, you know, like when a jungle troll meets with the dark troll, um, the, it's always trolling. Okay. Um, and, uh, well, sorry, uh, yeah, um, and that's kind of the only way jungle trolls have trolling. If a female jungle troll meets with a male dark troll, it'll have trolling, because they don't have trolling, the jungle trolls. They weren't cursed by uh, Gwaji. Um, and, but when, but it's in general, when, when two trolls interbreed, the result is Tolkien. Except a great troll, which are always male, with a dark troll, doesn't always make Tolkien. But, you know, it does half the time. So, it's still not, not perfect. Um, um, Speaking of Tolkien, do cave trolls have Tolkien? Tro tro cave trolls have Tolkien if they mate with something that's not a cave troll. If they mate with a cave troll, it's half the time trolling. And if they mate with like a dark... In fact, in one of the early scenarios, there's a cave troll living with a dark troll. Female cave troll, male dark troll. And, all, and, and, and they, they have all trolling children. Because that, that's what happens when you mix. And then they're like... I forget which scenario thing it's in, but they're, they're in a, a cave somewhere and they're one of the encounters you can have. They're hostile, obviously. These are just trolls living in, like out bushwhacking. Um, people. So, uh, because trolls live the life of a uh, of a pack predator, a pack or a lone predator, instead of you know a more a more sedentary life. Um, so even when they form like little towns and stuff, there's not there's not really a troll city anywhere except an imit except when they've made one kind of an imitation of human ones. They don't they, a village they might have you know, but. Uh, but they would never build a, a city like the dwarfs or the humans. Of course, the elves don't have cities either, really. So, the castle of Reed is not a city. What isn't? Castle of Reed. No, it's a, a it's a giant underground cavern. It's like a, the big, world's biggest dungeon. Okay. <clears throat> it's full of hideous insects and treasures and traps and. Mm. And it's got all those cannibal goals. giants. What? And it's got all those. Goals. It has and it has one room that is the Hall of Golden Lead, which which. Really bad trollkin or trolls are sitting there and they lock the door and it kills them. True exposure. Uh, and that's based right off the scene in The Mole Men. In the wolf. In the movie The Mole Men. Never see it? 1950s? Uh, there's a scene, The Mole Men, what happens is that these guys are in Tibet and there's an earthquake and they go underground and there's ancient Sumerians there who hid underground from Alexander the Great. Of course. <coughs> and, uh, and they're very pale because, you know, they've lived underground since Alexander the Great's time. But, but, there's also non-human creatures there, which are the mole men, which have huge bug eyes. Like, all underground creatures have huge eyes, right? So they have that. And they have huge claws, which make more sense than the eyes. And, uh, but they're slaves of the Sumerians, who are bad guys. And the way they, the way they execute people is they have the, the hall of fire and they open the door and put him in there and they take him out again after the after a certain time period and they're all like fried and steaming well they want to execute the, the humans the, the, the humans the, the heroes that way and it turns out that the hall that the hall of death is a, a, pit, a pit leading to the surface and the, when the sun goes overhead it shines down and it will kill the Sumerians but, but not us right so they, they had no idea Anyway, the humans stimulate a revolt among the hideous mole men monsters, and so it ends in a huge fight with the mole men and the Sumerians, and the heroes get away. Um, so it's kind of an unusual monster movie because the mole men are kind of the good guys almost, you know? And, uh, but back in the 60s, because there weren't, there weren't, they were like, they were trying to pitch the mole men as a new classic monster, like, like Dracula or Frankenstein or something, but they never really took because they didn't have sequels. There's not anything else you can really do with the Mole Men, right? <coughs> but that hall 
where the light shone on them and it, and it killed them, but not anyone else. So that could be a fun thing too, if you're captured by the trolls who don't realize they might like try to execute the humans by locking them in the Hall of Golden Light. So you say that uh, this huge stack of wheels in the absolute dark, they glow. Oh sure, of course I would. <laughs> gold is light. It's not earth gold, it's Garantha gold. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's the condensed, same, the, it's condensed eye. <laughs> the same way that the same way that silver will, can build up a static charge in Glorantha. Because it's connected to to um, moon and uh, air. Okay. <coughs> and quicksilver floats. I mean, it's not, I mean, you know, they all have a magical part of it. Um, someone, I don't know if it was your, did a essay on, um, uh, written by some god learner or someone about metallurgy in Glorantha, where the guy took a, a staff of, uh, s of some metal, not bronze, up to the top of a mountain, left it there to be hit by lightning over the course of a year. When he came back, he checked it, and there was like some bronze alloy forming in it from the lightning. Not silver, I mean. No, he, he had to be bronze. Because bronze is also the store metal. Um, then there's the argument over why there's so much bronze in Glorantha. And one argument is because the storm gods got killed a lot. But another argument is that the bronze storm gods got killed on the surface. And yet another argument is because you can actually make bronze by putting tin and copper together, which you can't do with other... With, you can't do that with like silver or quicksilver. Well, I mean, brass would make really sucky weapons and armor. Uh, no, no, uh, brass is uh, basically also tin bronze. No, it's zinc and bronze, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, in this one, not in brown. Well, if it's the same, then it would be the same. It wouldn't be brass, it would then be bronze. Yeah, uh, we have brass mustard, who are the allies. Yeah, I know, the, uh, the but I think there's zinc, I think there's zinc and, and uh, bronze, not tin and bronze. I don't know about zinc and bronze, do you? What? I don't think there's zinc in Glorantha. Why not? <laughs> they have more than five metals. Or six metals. Just because they don't have... You can have metals that aren't elemental metals. They have tin. We know that. Yeah. So, tin, you know, so obviously they have metals beyond the, the magical ones. I mean, they may not have tin, but in that case, who knows? Okay. So... Uh, <clears throat> Let's see what else is there to know about trolls. Well, um, talk about the horn. Oh, sea trolls. Sea trolls were um, were trolls, obviously, that, moved, that invaded the sea. And what happened to them is they got hit by the chaos rift forming in the middle of Glorantha, um, which if you played God's War, you had a first-hand look at how this works. Okay, and so the sea trolls. Uh, became chaotic. Uh, the same way that the cave trolls were, became chaotic because they were cursed by um, Kerjalk in the battle. They were fighting trolls. Because you fight chaos, you sometimes become chaos. So now the cave trolls and the sea trolls aren't like super chaotic. I mean, the cave trolls aren't super chaotic. That might be because the trolls have been trying to breed away the chaos over time with some success. Um, they aren't, I mean, they aren't like ravening chaos monsters like uh, jackal bears or brews, right? Um, the sea trolls are probably more chaotic because they haven't been affected by the culture of the dark trolls. So the sea trolls pretty much act just like monsters. They don't have a culture of any sort. Um, whereas the cave trolls don't really have a culture, but they have more of a one than the sea trolls. Um, and the sea trolls like are pretty minor because they live in the water and they're, it's full of uh, mermaids and, and sea monsters. And so they just kind of like are a thing there that is an extra predator. Uh, <laughs> other trolls. Um, I guess I could talk about the, um, uh, the kingdom of ignorance. So the trolls there uh, set up a, uh, a kingdom and, uh, and ruled the humans and set up gladiatorial games in honor of their various false gods 
in which the humans would die and then the trolls would eat the losers. Um, and uh, and they, they continued this for centuries, uh, you know, until they were overthrown by the, by the dragons, uh, uh, by the mandarins from the, from south. And then, you know, there's still traces, they're still ignorant up there and, and usually bad things and, and, and cults that are, that are bad for you and like all the anti-vaxxers and flat earthers come from the kingdom of ignorance, you know, the equivalent of that. Uh, social justice people, you know, gender fluids, anyway. Um, that's, that's kind of the purpose of the kingdom of ignorance. So, uh, in one of our adventures, I tried to get the players to go to the kingdom of ignorance, but they never would. So I'm guessing no, probably no one ever goes there. Just things come out of it, you know. We, we did ignorance of people too. Well, kind of. Um, <laughs> so that's a lot of stuff about trolls. Some of which you may have heard before. Some of which you may not have. Um, do you have any questions about trolls or other elder races? I'm so surprised they know about inflation. The what? Inflation. That's what they want to do. They want that's to what they want to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They want it. Well, yeah. They want to make the money worthless. Yeah. They know that'll be bad for the human economy. The trolls are smart, right? They, they, yes. they they're not always sophisticated, no. you know. And they may not know exactly what it'll do to the human society, because the troll society, though they have money and know how it works and know why it's good. It's not all based around money. It's based around social relations. You know, more than money. Okay. Yes. Have there been any Mr. Stray's troll birds uh, of their kind? Yes, absolutely. They aren't very common, obviously, but they, they have them. Um, usually, like, for example, when two Mr. Stray's trolls mate, the result is often a Mr. Well, not, you know, some of the time it's a Mr. Stray's. Um, they don't mate very often. Um, uh, they're dangerous creatures. Sometimes they kill each other, um, which the so the dark trolls try to like keep them apart. Um, but yeah, there are occasional trolls. Often, or they'll have a worship ceremony, like it'll be Holy Day, and it'll be a really auspicious Holy Day this time because Kyger later herself appeared, and then there'll be a Mr. Stray's birth. And they go woohoo! And sometimes they have a virtual Mr. Stray's birth where they where all the signs say this is going to be Mr. Stray's, and then like. A dark troll is born, but they declare it a mistress race because, you know, for propaganda purposes. Yes. And then they raise it like a mistress race. And then, like, it's a really privileged dark troll, so it's still pretty cool, you know. And also, so, and it might just be a dark troll that has, like, really high stats. But, uh, but there are genuine mistress races. They're just super rare. They don't become player characters because, like, all the troll nations are supporting them, trying to keep them alive. They are giving them training and stuff. And they do eventually let them go out adventuring, sort of, with like guards of great trolls and stuff, so they can get experience and build up. But it'd be so cheating to be one. You know, it'd be like if you wanted to play a, a store worm or something, you know, or a dream dragon. So. But if you could be the troll party and uh, keeping them alive. You could. Hmm. Why not? If you wanted to have a game where you're all trolls. <coughs> what about Crack Spider? Oh, so, so Crack Spider is a Mr. Trace. Yes. Um, uh, she, but she also got come sometime in the god in during the uh, dark dark times. She ascended in a hero quest and contacted Arachne Solara directly before there was Arachne Solara and helped form it. And that's why she has the spider form. And because of that. Although she's a mistress race that would probably breed nothing but mistress race, nobody likes to mate with her because she eats her husbands. Because she's a black widow. She has husbands? Well, not no, <laughs> only one at a time, then she eats them. She's a black widow. One, one at a time. <laughs> so, 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 like, no one's volunteering to be your husband, yes. right? Uh, um, but she's the person that made the great trance. That was her attempt. So, actually, it was a failure. She just lost her Hmm? What did she she made the she's the she's the person that did the spell that made the great trolls. Yeah. So she has a, a whole a lot of great trolls. Most of them are hers. Um, or maybe not most of them now. Originally they were all hers. Then they kind of she had gifted them away and did things with them. And other people found out how to make them with the ritual and they spread. And you know how they even have great trolls in Hamilton now. How did she uh, end up with the pillow of fire? I don't know. 
I know she's the fire witch. She might have been, she might have accompanied Zorak Saran on his quest to destroy the fires when he got the fire. Mm. You know, so it might be the fire that Yomalu used to have, which is what uh, Zorak, Zorak Saran's fire is. But I'm not exactly sure where the fire came from. Okay. Maybe it's all that gold. How did it happen that you guys, uh, when, when you decided to do Troll Pack as an individual, like, was it one of the first? I was super excited about trolls, and I sent Greg a, um, a diagram of troll anatomy with the two stomachs. Hmm. And, um, and then we started talking about it. This is after I was at Chaosium. We started talking about how cool, maybe, maybe it wasn't. I was, I was not full time at Chaosium. And then like we worked together to make the evolutionary tree of trolls. Yeah. And, uh, and then I just started writing stuff. I wrote this, you know, like the scenarios and the troll cults and the troll monsters. And Greg wrote most of the source book. And we did all this troll stuff. And uh, I just was like very enthusiastic about trolls in the early 80s. So a troll pack became one, and then the whole idea was we're going to do dwarf pack and elf pack and dragon pack, and then we never did anything else. We only did troll pack. So a lot of the plans we had, just like we do the first one in the series, then we stop. Like cults of Praxis are supposed to be followed by cults of Dragon Pass, and you know cults of I don't know. Maybe we didn't hold the country, but Cassium had plans. I mean, a lot of Cassium's plans were made sitting in the ware warehouse sucking on weed, right? So, <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's where we had our business meetings. We'd go back into the warehouse and they'd pull out a big old hooter and they'd all puff on it and pass it around. They always passed it to me then because I was a good Mormon boy. I wouldn't smoke it, so I'd pass it to the next guy. Uh, so I got secondhand smoke, but I wasn't actually <laughs> puffing on the thing itself. You know? But, uh, so yeah, I mean that. I mean, if you think about it that way, well, here's an example of of, of Chaosium's greatness. So after after the the power struggle that ousted Greg from Chaosium, <coughs> there's only Charlie and Lynn. So Charlie's in charge of the business aspects of Chaosium, and Lynn is doing the uh, um, the, the editing and the layout and trying to take as much credit for all the products as he can, which is why his name became went from being an editor to an author on everything. Um, and, uh, but he did a lot of great editing. So, so, so Charlie, so we, so we did the game Mythos. That's what broke up the company is Mythos because, uh, they did Mythos and it was super successful for Chaosium by Chaosium standards. Yeah. And, and so they made, had all this money and then Greg said, and then we did the first expansion and it made a fair amount of money. And Greg said, okay, let's take this money and sock it away. Cause Mythos has gone through its second term. Is, is second print run, and it's probably not going to go any further. I mean, we can keep printing it, but it's not going to boom and keep and be big like like Magic the Gathering. Let's face it, Mythos is about its course. Take the money, hold on to it, and survive. And Greg and Charlie said, "No, no, Mythos will sell forever. We should we should boom into Mythos and and put everything in Mythos." And this discussion became so acrid that they voted that Greg and Charlie voted. It's Charlie. Charlie and Lynn voted Greg out. And then they decided to go big on Mythos. And, that, and of course, Greg was right in this case. I mean, Greg wasn't always right in his business ideas, but this time he was. But, but the greatest thing was, so at this point, about midway through the 90s, uh, maybe this shouldn't be filmed. <laughs> so, so Charlie went from having a, uh, um, uh, a hooter in the afternoon to also having one in the morning. Okay, so I mean he's pretty he's pretty big on weed, you know. So <coughs> so he's having one in the morning, and he calls Lampa, the printing company that makes Mythos, and he ordered um, and they they wanted they wanted two thousand copies of of Mythos of the Mythos expansion. This was the uh, I can't yeah. remember the, name, the, the one. yeah the Strange Eons one. Okay, the one that had me. So it's the greatest expansion. Because I'm in it. Also, Greg's in it. And so there's a pub quiz of who is better in combat, Greg or Sandy? And the answer is Sandy because I had a combat of two and Greg had a combat of one in Mythos. Yes. So you can tell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, um, <coughs> 
he, ta- he, he calls Lampa and orders the expansion. And then a couple weeks later, it's shipped to the warehouse and it's 20,000 copies. Yes. Because he had slipped of the tongue and said 20,000 instead of 2,000. And he'd never checked to make sure it was 2,000. He'd never, do- looked, he'd never looked at the invoice. And so Cassian was on the hook to pay for 20,000 copies. And there weren't 20,000 copies of Mythos. And this is an expansion. How many, I don't know how many copies of Mythos were sold. I know they sold enough that that was the, that that was the last time until 2015 that Chaosium paid me my royalties for Call of Cthulhu. So Greg, basically when Greg, Greg paid the royalties, then he was ousted. Then Charlie didn't pay them until 2015 after Lynn died because then um, they made their money on the 7th edition Kickstarter. And then Greg realized that with Lynn's death, the, Lynn's shares revert back to the company. So that means that, so basically Lynn, Charlie, and Greg owned equal shares of Chaosium. And then I had this little bit, I was like, I had like 3% or something. Um, <coughs> but with Lynn, so when Greg, so with Lynn and Charlie were around, they had the majority shares. They had, you know, 65% or something. So like Greg was out. But when Lynn died, the shares go back to the company. So now Greg and Charlie have equal shares. Except I have my three, well, my three percent is up to like four and a half percent, because because my reward do. So I'm the kingmaker between them. So both Greg and Charlie are calling me to get me on their side in the power struggle, because they're still kind of bitter against each other because of the ousting, and um, so I'm trying to make both sides happy, uh, and. Uh, it, well, it worked for a while. We worked with Charlie for like a year and a half to try to see if we could make things work. But one of the ways Charlie tried to get me to be on his side was by using the money, some of the money from the seventh edition to pay my back royalties since 1996. 20 years of back royalties. So, yay. Um, but, I mean, it didn't really work because, like, he had, he'd had 20 years to pay the royalties and he only did it when he needed my help. So I wasn't as grateful as he thought. Um, I figured if Greg had won the power struggle, anyway. So, so anyway, twenty thousand strange eons almost bankrupt. It dropped the company down from a pop, from a, from about ten people to like two. You know, it was it was disastrous. How come these one of us sold? Hmm? How come these one of us sold off? Because. It's an expansion for the game Mythos. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I never saw any, any of those anywhere in the shop. I had strange eons. I, I, I think I remember it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I got copies of it. I mean, I, I didn't see much. But, well, I mean, I don't know. I thought they were sold. But, uh, yeah, maybe. but you know, probably, probably the number that were sold were about 2,000, which is what he'd originally ordered. <laughs> you know, and the distributors aren't going to order more than two thousand. They know how the, the distributors know. Oh, I have five hundred mythos in stock. I'll buy a hundred and fifty of strange eons. So most of them were just ju- pulped. You know. Can we get back to trolls and you tell us about blue moon trolls? Blue about what trolls? Blue moon trolls. They're dark trolls. Mm-hmm. That live on the moon. There are trolls that worship the blue moon, so they work as assassins for her. There's actually human assassins too, and the reason that the blue moon has trolls is because it goes through the underworld, you know, and picks them up. Ah. Well, well it goes through the underworld this way, right? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and then it picks up the trolls from the underworld. The it can, yeah. Okay. New trolls cool. being born attached to it, and they can live on the moon. I mean, it's livable, like. Just like the red moon, and uh, so a lot of the cold. That's one of the reasons that the blue moon isn't. You don't see a lot of blue moon stuff because a lot of the blue moon stuff, people that want to worship the blue moon, find their way to the blue moon, and that's so hard to do to get out of the blue moon that automatically, if you get there, you're kind of like so elite that you kind of have an in to join the cult. So they aren't really a good player character cult, but they're better as enemies anyway. So when Greg wisely decided to remove the spells Concealment, Invisibility, and um, there was some other spell in that category that we hated, the Vision spell. Yeah. 
because those sucked for game masters. They're just the worst. So we took those out of the main circulation. Those are the blue moon spells. The one that the, 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 I can't remember the name, but it was like a wizard eye spell. Yes. And that was just that was just a nightmare for game masters. So so uh, so we just we took those out because casting was always concerned with the game master experience. Hmm. So that's why they went away. That's why they went away. What's worse for your for your adventure than having some dude like take wizard eye and explore your castle? I mean, it just sucks, right? Or saying, well, I've concealed so the enemies can't see me, so the, all the trolls walk by me. You know, I guess you could say something like, well, the trolls have radar, so they see you. Because they, well, they'll sonar. But, uh, but then the guy's, but I'm concealed. And then you have to an argument with the players and everything's bad, so you just, like, get rid of it. Plus, there was the famous occasion when Ken Coffer jumps up and says, we're going to attack the enemies. And he says, follow me, men, and then casts invisibility on himself. <laughs> <laughs> So that kind of, at that point, we said, you know, why don't we have this spell? <laughs> and, was, we, and so we don't. Was that Aerosilk Sword? That was who? Aerosilk Sword, the character, who later gave birth to the Invisible Child. I don't know which character of Ken's it was. Um, it might have been Erg the Ugly, you know. In that case, it might have been cast by his horse. <laughs> That's back when, when, when characters still had uh, 3D6 in which I changed that in, because I said, we have to have things that are subhuman in intelligence. And if human int can go to three to 18, you can't have subhuman intelligence. Yes. So, so I made it eight to 18, and that way Tolkien, or so, someone that had an average of seven, like Pietro, is just stupider than a human would normally be, which is I like. Also the same for size, because if humans can be size three, how can there be dwarfs? What are they, size two, you know? Um, <laughs> so humans are also eight to 18. And, but Earth the Ugly was in the old days, so his int was three. And his horse, which at the original RuneQuest had an int of 2d3, had an int of four. So his horse was smarter than he was. But Erg also had an 18 strength. I always figured that Ken probably fudged the dice rolls, you know. Um, so, uh, but you know, Erg actually once, they had to go through some kind of fence line, and Erg carried the war horse over the fences, so. <laughs> they had, he had to make a roll to do it. <clears throat> because even Erg the Ugly was a lot. And everyone, everyone like accused him of being a half troll, because his app was like three or four, but he, he wasn't rolled up as a half troll, he just like was really ugly. <laughs> and he's also the one that started the gold wheel dancer thing, because he, he had the wheels. He, he saw that people valued gold, and Ken played him as being an, a, like almost retarded, right? And so he decided that gold was valuable, so he collected the gold. And of course, this is a great Steve Perrin's campaign, which was like, you could get all kinds of treasure. So eventually he had a wagon load of like 20 or 30,000 wheels wow. going around from everywhere. So there's Erg and this horse and this giant wagon load of gold wheels. And eventually Erg the Ugly is killed. And, um, and Greg decree, oh yeah, I remember. Greg had his, uh, Erg the Ugly had his gold and he would pray to it because that was his God, because he knew the other people prayed, and his God would be the gold. And one day when he was praying to it, asking for a miracle, one of the wheels popped out a gold wheel dancer. And of course, after that, you could never talk Urg out of his gold God. That was it. But that's the gold wheel dancer that's on the cradle scenario. It was from Urg the Ugly's thing. He prayed, it became alive, it went there, so that's his contribution. And just so you know, Ken Coffer, I don't know if he's, Ken Coffer for years, he worked in his dad's, Catholic store that sold Catholic goods like candles and things. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if his dad's still alive, but. Uh, what do they look like, the gold wheel dancer? I don't think I ever seen They are them. described in the cradle scenario. There's a big ring of gold that rolls around the outside of the thing, but they can also take a humanoid form, okay. in which case they're kind of a sexless, golden, gold skinned, hairless, or smooth haired thing. Kind of like the Silver Surfer, except gold. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What was the most exciting project that never happened for you in your life? If you were really into it. Someone said a book. The Pamatello book was pretty was pretty cool. Um, you know, part of the problem with casting was we had the we had these plans for the future, and then 
before they got enough underway for me to get my heart set on them, we'd go off and do something else like the Prince Valiant game. You know, so I never had a chance to get into a pro like I had projects at my other jobs. I had projects that I got way into and I was super enthusiastic about that then would get canceled. And that that would suck big time. But Cassie never got very if we ever got very deep in anything, then we'd finish it. Yeah. So probably the closest we got to something that we were in quite a ways that we didn't finish was um, uh, uh, what, what was the Masters of Luck and Death, which we actually had counters for. Mm -hmm as a board game. And the, and, and, the, and the players were individual candidates for herohood who were running around doing things, trying to collect all the stuff on the map and get allies and do things. You had die cuts counters already. We had, we had um, <coughs> die cut counters that we bought from SPI's blank die cut counter sheets. Okay. And we'd drawn the, the things on them, drawn the numbers on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were die cut counters, there was dice, there was rules that weren't quite to the point of solid playtesting yet. And uh, at that point we were like, well, you know, Dragon Pass isn't selling that well, and plus we just sold it off to, 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 to Avalon Hill, and we, Nomad Gods is out of print, and we really want to do a board game, and we're kind of going more towards the role playing stuff, and Call of Cthulhu is selling really well, so maybe it's my fault. We also had a plan, now one of the plans at Chaosium that I was super excited for, that we never did, which is not Glorantha related, was after Arkham Horror, we were going to do Dunwich Horror, and um, which, uh, which the, the monsters were trying to go up to the top of the hill to summon Yogg-Sothoth, and it was going to have a train station in it like Arkham Horror, and you could travel between the two games on the train station. And then eventually we were going to do a third Innsmouth Horror, and the train went there too. So we're going to have like three board games like Arkham Horror that all connected. But then I left the company and it never happened. And Arkham Horror got sold to Fantasy Flight, who did a fantastic version of it. Even if I have reviled it in this very room as being too long to play, which I will stand by that estimation. But it still is not a bad game, it just takes a long time to play. But I can't really condemn it totally for that because one of my favorite games is World in Flames, which takes like six months to play. So how I can look down at a game that takes a long time, but, but my games and I design them don't take too long. Terror Pass takes a little while, it takes like two, three, four hours, but Terror Pass, since you can only play the scenario once, it's, I think it's okay to have it be pretty lush and a full heavy duty experience. Terror Pass is the game we're going to release next year, not going to be Kickstarter, going straight to the market, which I talked about yesterday, but you guys weren't here for it because you're bad, so be aware of that. Um, it's a uh, it's the Call of Cthulhu Terror Paths, new Cthulhu board game by me in which you are cooperatingly investigating some awful, awful thing. For example, one of the scenarios is um, an underground cavern where Githians are coming through time. Another is a rock uh, band concert in the woods that worships the king in yellow. You have to save the teenagers. Um, and. Uh, and it's co-op, and you don't know how to win at the start of the game. You have to work it out as you go. So that's part of the fun. Fabian's played it. Yeah. Thanks. You've played It Bestirs, which have the people mutating. Yeah. Have you played the one where, where you're imprisoned in the basement by the fungi? No, the caverns and the caverns and the uh, silver toilet box. i got to start playtesting that thing again. Because, not that it's, it's done, but I have new scenarios I need to test. Because the scenario, since the scenarios are one-offs, then um, the, the core game scenarios are tested, and I have to, I mean, like, the expense, it's cheap. It, doesn't, it only has cardboard counters. So it's like a, it's like a $30, $40 game. And then the, ex, the expansion packs are like $10, and each of them has a bunch of new scenarios, new maps. Um, and every scenario is unique with its own enemies, its own everything. It's like, they're very different. That's part of the fun. The idea, one of the things about Arkham Horror that, 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 uh, is that although there's different plot lines and stuff, really all the Arkham Horrors go kind of the same way. You know, you go, you're going around closing the gates and there's monsters. Whereas the Terror Pass, the individual stars, you're doing really different things. You know, maybe you're trying to um, save the women from the <coughs> Starry Wisdom Church who are imprisoned. <laughs> <coughs> or you're trying to topple the dolmens that are summoning, summoning Ithaca. <coughs> or, or one of them you're trying to 
to set off a uh, an ancient atomic bomb in the caverns. I mean, they're just really bizarre scenarios. So. That's what they would do. Yes. Yeah, that's one of them. Or well, you're trying to escape a forest fire, which is caused by fire vampires. So you know, they're all mythos related. Fabian standing up because he's sick of this. No, I love it. It's, it's, it's 11. It's time for Jason. Jason's time. <laughs> <laughs>